Okay, well, let's get started. Welcome everybody to the March 18th uh, working group meeting. I'm pleased to see you all here. I'm pleased that we have two excellent speakers lined up for today. I remind you that the meeting is being live streamed and is recorded and that the recordings will be available afterwards. Uh, so please take that into account. Uh, our speakers have generously agreed to stay on half an hour after the meeting to have discussions with people who would like to discuss with them. That's purely voluntary, but it's a great opportunity to talk in a little more detail than the format that we have uh, allows in the main meeting. So I hope many of you will take that opportunity. Uh, there'll be breakout rooms assigned uh, and uh, you'll be able to join and speak to either or both of our speakers in more detail. And so the usual reminder, uh, Reinhardt can't be with us today. Uh, co-lead with me on the working group. Uh, people will know Jim Sluka uh, from his work on emails and also on uh, scientific and website issues. And then everyone will know Bruce from the wonderful job he does organizing things. As always, I have to remind you there is a Slack channel. It only works if we use it. Uh, if people have other suggestions about better ways of communicating, that's fine. Uh, also, please help us. The wiki page could probably use some love and some new material. So uh, any group member can have access to posting on the wiki page. Uh, and uh, if you need help getting access either to the Slack or the wiki, please contact Bruce or Jim. Uh, please do, do take advantage of those facilities. I'll also remind you that tomorrow uh, morning at 11 a.m. we have a steering committee meeting. Uh, the steering committee is generally composed of the people who are leading the various subgroups. However, if you think you should be on the steering committee and you're not, and you want to participate in yet another meeting, uh, you are most welcome to contact us and let us know. We don't want to be exclusive on this. Um, and if you have are on the steering committee and you are going to be there and you have suggestions for agenda items for tomorrow, uh, please let us know. The general rules of the meeting are because the talks are very short, sort of teasers, uh, the purpose of these talks, 15, 20 minutes uh, max, is to give people ideas, to meet people, uh, to understand things that are exciting and to find new opportunities for collaboration and serendipitous connections. And because of the short format, uh, the opportunity for questions, depending on how long people take, because it's hard for people to talk 15 minutes when they're asked to speak for 15 minutes. Uh, some people do, but I know I have a trouble with that. Uh, we sometimes don't have as much time for questions as we'd like. And so if there is a question session within the meeting, uh, we ask especially that we give, make room for those who uh, don't always ask questions because there's a lot of expertise in the room and to focus on more general questions. Now that we have the breakout sessions, we have room for detailed and technical discussion afterwards. And uh, if people seem to be running over uh, time, I will give the speakers a five minute warning uh, as a routine thing just to, to remind people of the time limits. For upcoming meetings, as requested, we had a wonderful talk from Veronica last week summarizing the work done in the innate and adaptive immune response subgroup. Uh, Jacob Barak is going to give us a subgroup summary next week. Uh, and then we have David Ada uh, talking at the University of Minnesota uh, by physical modeling of viral life cycle, which I think will be quite exciting. Uh, coming up, we have some uh, very impressive speakers. Uh, Denise Kirshner will be talking about her wonderful uh, multi-scale modeling work on tuberculosis. And we have a couple of other very interesting people lined up a little further on uh, who are going to be talking about various aspects of multi-scale modeling and model sharing, and also on experimental work uh, that they've been doing to validate these very, very complex models. I'd very much appreciate suggestions for future speakers. Uh, anybody that you can find uh, would like to hear, that's great. Uh, there also has been some suggestion that uh, the working group meetings, the main working group meetings uh, might benefit 
from having uh, occasional time to have more uh, freeform discussion. Uh, April 1st, maybe that's ominous date, but April 1st, uh, we have one speaker lined up. Um, and so it's possible that we could use the other slot for more freeform discussion. And so if there are people who have uh, discussion topics that they'd like to raise uh, to use this meeting for discussion purposes on April 1st, uh, please let me, uh, Reinhardt and Bruce know, uh, and we can use that uh, slot for 25, 30 minute uh, discussion of issues uh, that uh, might be of interest to the community. So I'd, I'd ask people uh, for their ideas on that. If that works out well, we can move to uh, having more uh, of those. Uh, the alternative, of course, use for that would be to have one of the other subgroups present uh, if anyone would like to do that. So I also remind the, our speakers that if you don't get through all of the material you want to present in today, you're always welcome to come back and give a follow on talk. Uh, everyone who we've had speak has had so much material to present in the finite amount of time that they'd all be interesting to hear from a second time. So please feel free to say you'd like to come back. Uh, we hope we're a friendly audience. For that. Okay, with that, I don't want to take up any more of our speakers' time. Our first speaker will be Giannis Kevitis uh, from Johns Hopkins, uh, who's worked uh, on all sorts of very interesting uh, mathematical issues related to modeling. And uh, people who are regulars on this meeting know I don't do a big formal introduction. So I will simply turn it over to Giannis. Thank you. So A, it's a pleasure to be here. B, do you see my screen? Not yes. yet. Uh, let me see what went wrong. So share screen, share. Now? Now we see it. Yes. Ah, okay, very good. Okay. So, um, okay, th there is one basic thing I want to talk about. There's one basic idea, the, the, and then we can discuss it. The basic idea is the following, uh, and this is why I think it maybe couples a little bit with the work that everybody is interested in here. Um, when we do models in space, Usually we do them in physical space. Uh, however, when you have problems in which uh, agents are connected along networks and interact with each other along networks, they may live somewhere in physical space, but maybe physical space is not the space in which you want to write the partial differential equation. So if you work with networks, for example, and I will show you some example of this, then it, it's true that maybe the nodes of the networks are points in physical space, one neighborhood, one house, one person, but the neighborhoodness in physical space is not representative of the neighborhoodness of the behavior. And so what I'm going to try and talk about today is how to try and find a nice spaces in which to embed complicated network dynamics so that they are effectively simple. Let's see how well I'm going to do that. But again, that's the point. The point is, if it's not a good idea to write a PDE in physical space, can we write a PDE in a smarter space, an emergent space, God help us to use the word, in which the system makes sense to be modeled as a PDE, in the sense that nearby behaviors are embedded near each other. Let me see how much I sense I can make of this, and you will tell me if I did. First, you know, something old. You, you know how the old professor says, Oh, all of this is wrong, and I published it first anyway. So this is something from 1992, uh, in which what we did is that we used neural networks at the time to learn partial differential equations. So if you have spatiotemporal data, but you don't know what the operator is, then how can you learn the operator online from data? Um, the basic idea is very simple. Let me just say a simple thing. If you take... Um, Nearby. So let's say you have a partial differential equation. If you have a few nearby points in space, then you can use those finite differences to estimate the derivatives. And what is a partial differential equation, a parabolic one in this case? It is the time derivative at the mesh point as a function of the space derivatives at the mesh point. So when you have spatiotemporal data, every point in space time from the solution that you have can be used to learn the PD. 
And what you see in on the right is uh, maybe it's not so clear, but the basic idea is by using extension of these five points, you learn the DDT in the middle. By learning the nearby five points, the DDT in the middle. So basically, this is something that by now is known, convolutional neural networks are really finite different tensors. Uh, if you don't have a sense of this, it's kind of fun to think. Okay, so this is something we've been doing for a long time, but the thing that we kind of started revisiting more recently is what if you have a lot of fine scale behavior, agent based, let's say individual based, molecular based, and you want to learn a partial differential equation for a macroscopic observable, for the density, for the pair correlation function. So you want to do hydrodynamic level equations from observations of agent-based things. And that is also something that is easily doable. If, you know, they, they take my word for it, or you've done it, it's not difficult. You just look at the coarse-grained observations, and then you learn the PDE at the coarse-grained level. But what I really want to talk to you, ah, this is a little example. So, you know, E. coli chemotaxis, for those of you that uh, know Hans Othmer's work and many good people, okay, you can create individual based models, which at the macroscopic level close like keller zegel or something like that. So what's the idea? You observe the micro, you run the microscopic model. If you know the right observables, let's say the cell density, what you can do is that you observe cell density as a function of time, and then you can go on and learn the chemotactic <coughs> equations yourself. So this is a little example. Let me tell you what the movie is. What you're going to see on the left is 5,000 cells in one dimension. They are E. coli. They have internal states. They have six flagella. Each one of them runs dynamically, blah, blah. And, and by the way, they are green, red, or uh, green, yellow, or blue depending on whether they go left, they go right, or they are tumbling. So this is a messy agent-based model. It is 5,000 coupled sets of two, of two stochastic differential equations. You run it, and what I want you to see in the middle, the green is the chemoattractant, and then there is the blue and the red curves, where most of the time, what you do is that you just uh, they will just overlap visually. Let me run it. What you see is the agents running, and in the middle, the red is the observation of the fine scale model. The blue is the simulation of the effective learned PDE. So this is something to just say, this is easily doable. It's not a big deal. If you know what the right macro variable is, you run the micro, you learn the macro equation, and then you play with the macro equation. I am saying this to only say, let me say, say it once again, it's kind of not bad, to see what all the agents are doing and in the middle what the PDF of the agents is doing and also the learned effective chemotactic equation. Okay, on the right, what you see is how many cells at any given moment are tumbling, how many are going left and how many are going right. So again, the main point in this, and again, I'm not saying anything, it's possible to look at micro and learn macro PDs. It's also interesting that if you know a part of the macro equation, so just only see where my pointer is at the bottom here, you can either learn as black box the entire chemotactic equation, or if you know a part of it, you can learn only the part that you don't know. So these are gray box PDE models. You can learn, let's say, only the closure for the chemotactic term. Okay, so in general, if you know the right quantity, let's say macroscopically, you want to look at the agent density, you can learn macroscopic PDs. What I want to talk to you about today is something that is more fun. So here is the fun part. Let me see if I can do a good job. I would like you to look at this map of Germany. On the right, there is cities in Germany on the map. On the left, what you do is that on any given day, you go to one of these cities and every five minutes, you look if the sun is up. If the sun is not up, it's black. If the sun is up, it's yellow. So every city becomes a, a big Boolean vector of zeros and ones. But you understand whether the sun is up or not is related to where they are on the map. If one takes these Boolean vectors and does principal components or something fancier like diffusion maps, then you find that this is a two parameter family of vectors. And if you project on the first two principal components or the first two diffusion map coordinates, or if you want on the first two isomap coordinates, you get something that is one to one with a map of Germany. I take this to be something like um, a realization of this English saying that handsome is as handsome does. 
Like you look at the activity and the activity tells you where you are, okay? So the idea is then that if you don't know where you are, but you look at what happens where you are, you can deduce where you are in space. So here is an example from a partial differential equation. This is a one dimensional partial differential equation. It happens to be Ginzburg Landau. This is space, this is time. The patterns are the solution of the PD. What you do is that you take this, this data, as it, this page as it comes out of your printer and you push, put it through a shredder. You put it through a shredder and you get 512 time series and then you scramble the time series. So now you have the activity at 500 points, but you don't know where the 500 points are in space. You will agree with me, I'm saying this very fast, but I hope I'm saying it okay. This is like having a puzzle. It's just that the pieces of the puzzle are long strips rather than being little squares. And by looking at which strip is close to which strip, so by doing data mining with smoothness as your main tool, you can solve the puzzle and you can reconstruct the space. So the idea is, I have space. I intentionally scramble it and just look at the behaviors without knowing where they come from. I can use the behavior, I can use data mining to put the behaviors together to reconstruct the space. So here is one version, one dimension in space. Here is a two dimensional version. This is a 2D PD in X and Y and time. What you do is that you take this cube of behavior and you push it through a meat grinder. You get 20,000 strings, okay? 20,000 time series. If you think of each of these time series as a data point and you do data mining, then you find that it was a two parameter family of time series and you can reconstruct the space. Please notice it's not exactly the original space. It is something that is isomorphic to the original space. It's one to one. So again, if you don't, if you, if there is space, but you don't know it because you scrambled it yourself, you can look at the behavior and reconstruct it. You're going to tell me, thank you very much. You knew the behavior or you scrambled it yourself. And then you can say that you can unscramble it. Where is this useful? Here is where this is useful. Here is a whole bunch of oscillators. Each one of them is a little point. They are kind of going to be running around. I'm going, this is one of the struggles so in interacting agent models, if you want. I run the oscillators. Uh, you look that they are colored with some funny color. Look, if I run them, then I find that they organize themselves along a very nice curve, which is parametrized by this color. And if I look at the behavior, the angle and the radius of the circle as a function of this color, then you find that it looks very much like a partial differential equation. So what I am telling you is you look at the oscillators and then you look at how heterogeneous their behaviors are. And by using the heterogeneity of the behavior, you can embed them in a very nice space. In retrospect, this space is the parametrization of their heterogeneity in which the behavior looks like a PD. So you can look at bunches of agents and then figure out in what space to embed them so that they look like a partial differential equation. And so what I'm gonna do now, this is all the same idea that I was telling you. This is the last little example that I want to show. Here is 1,024 neurons. They are, each one of them is a set of, I think two, or it could be 16 ordinary differential equations. They are coupled in a crazy way. This is a chung -Lu network. It's not all to all, it's not nearest neighbor. And what they do, as you see down here at the bottom, maybe, is that they synchronize. That is, each one of them is doing an oscillation. Of course, because they're all different, their oscillations are a little different. What do you do? You look at the oscillations, you do data mining on the behaviors, and then you find that, gee, this network could be embedded in a two-dimensional space. So these are two data-driven coordinates. They are emergent space variables, okay, such that if you look at the behavior of the network in these variables, it looks like a discretization of a partial differential equation. So this is not a place in which I had physical space and I just rediscovered it. This is a place where there is no space, but by looking at the behavior, you realize that there exists a nice space in which you can embed the stuff so that nearby neurons in this space have nearby behavior. And you can model the thing as a partial differential equation. And my last slide is a, is, is a movie of um, 
is a movie of this. If you play the neurons, just naming them one to a thousand, you just get a mess. They are all kind of going up and down in a messy way. But if you look at them in this more intelligent space, hold a moment, let me play the movie again, which is on the right, then you realize that it really looks like a smooth behavior and you can learn a PD. Why do I think this is maybe hopefully relevant for what everybody I perceive is interested and my interest in this is that if you look at what happens to people and physical space is a very bad variable to embed them and learn a PDE, then by looking at the behavior, we can discover what is the right deformation of physical space in which it would really make sense to describe the problem. So this is what I wanted to say. I was, I hope I was, if, if not coherent, at least a little bit entertaining. The idea is if you don't know what the right space is, data mining will tell you the space. I even think I have a summary slide. Let's see, here is the summary slide. Find the space in which you can embed the network dynamics first, and then learn the equation in that space. You can learn it either black box or gray box if you have an idea of what it would look like. That's it. I don't know how much more I run than 15 minutes. I hope not much more. No, that was perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. So I can stop sharing. So, so normally we, we hold the questions until uh, the end uh, so that we make sure we get through both talks. Um, I, I, I have to ask since I, I guess I have the privilege since I'm the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the MC. The, the, the boss. Uh, uh, which is, I, I see how this works beautifully for deterministic systems. Yes. If the behaviors are stochastic, do you have any way of doing something similar? You, the, the, the quick answer is, is yes. You will then not have a partial differential equation on this, but you will be evolving a measure on this manifold. So, so this would be more really like your bacterial, yes. your bacterial yes. example, yes. where the individual agents are stochastic. But yes. So there you saw an evolution. There you saw a PDE for the expected density. Okay, you can do not the expected density, but the expected density and its variance or something. So yes, it's doable. It is reasonable. It is not trivial, but yes, it's doable. Well, thank you. And we'll, we'll definitely come back for more questions after, okay. after the second talk. So, so our now second... Greg, Greg knows what I want to talk to him about. Okay, sorry, go, go ahead. Lovely. No, no, please. Um, so our second talk is uh, by Ashley Ford. And uh, she's going to be talking about multi-scale simulations of lung fibrosis. Uh, and I will turn it over to her without more ado. And I will make a five minute warning uh, if that's okay. Excellent. Okay, let's get this shared here. All right, seeing the PowerPoint now. So I am excited to be here to present to you all today, and um, we're this work is is um, highly collaborative. Um, but we're building a multi-scale lung tissue simulator and looking at the infection of SARS-CoV-2 and specifically tissue damage. And so a lot of what we're doing is going to focus on the lung epithelium and incorporating different scales of um, effects. So I am an associate professor in the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at the University at Buffalo, the State University of New York. Um, the important, uh, most important person for today's uh, presentation is Mohammed Aminal Islam, who is the postdoc who has put an extraordinary amount of effort in the last year um, on this project. So um, he, I think, is on the call today. So um, I would invite him to join us for the question session today, too. So there's a larger collaborative team, and I know that you all have, um, or this IMAG MSM group has heard from other components of this before. Um, so Paul Macklin, James's colleague, has uh, organized this collaborative group. Um, and then the two people that I've worked most closely with outside of my team, um, Thomas Hillen and Amber Smith. 
And if you're interested in the larger project, I encourage you to go to our PhysiSale page that has um, open access versions of all the codes and things that you can um, join in on and, and play with and, and explore and add to and contribute. So we are very interested in modeling the physiological processes that happen due to SARS-CoV-2 infection and the immune responses, and then thinking also um, about downstream types of consequences. Um, and so I'll show you different kinds of um, images like this about different processes we're interested in, about um, things that get disrupted due to the infection and the overall immune response. So we're considering COVID-19 as a multi-scale problem, and we do in the model consider subcellular effects where the virus binds to the um, ACE2 receptors and moves into healthy cells, and then where the virus itself can replicate and can release viral particles. At the cellular level, we have different um, agent-based rules for the um, death rate and the secretion of various other signals that can communicate between different cell types. And then we have the immune response where immune cells can um, phagocytose dead cells, attack infected cells. The tissue level we have where the viral released uh, virions can move through the tissue, the infection can spread, the tissue damage can spread, and um, both the immune cells and fibroblast cells are coordinated with various secreted factors. There's also a level of the model that communicates out to the lymphatic system to recruit more uh, immune cells that then could come in through the vasculature and respond. And my team is also interested in other things like the change in systemic angiotensin II um, and response to this, um, but I won't show you anything about that today. So the uh, most recent uh, version of our preprint has um, this kind of showing some of the immune dynamics and the intracellular um, viral part. So given a, a healthy epithelial cell in the lung, so thinking about this lining the airways or lining the, um, the alveolar region, that the virus can come in represented by this orange dot. There's some different viral replication processes that happen internally inside of each epithelial tissue agent that then secrete various factors. There's a whole cascade of immune cells, both the innate and adaptive immune system that respond. And I won't go into those details, um, but um, you can ask about them if you're interested later, but um, there's a whole, um, sub-team on the project that focuses on this immune response, and I was not part of that um, group. We also have this lymph node part. The part that's more interesting to me is when the T-cell response comes in, and T-cells can detect um, different inflammatory signals and the infection in these cells, and CD8 plus T-cells can induce the death of these infected cells. We, uh, on my team, were interested in how does fibrosis happen in response to this CD8 plus induced T cell killing and the this latter stage um, in acute respiratory distress when fibrosis starts to emerge. So it does not happen as part of the initial immune response. Um, data from Amber Smith's lab had shown that um, the fibrotic and more of the tissue structural changes were happening after the peak in T-cell response. And so that's why um, in a rule-based fashion, we were considering this um, CD8 plus T-cell response to be the main um, sequential trigger for um, our rules. So we considered this uh, adding fibroblasts and that as soon as this uh, infected cell is killed, then there would be an anti-inflammatory cytokine signal that would start. We considered two phenotypes of fibroblasts. So we'd have an inactive phenotype that's in the host tissue. So already residential fibroblasts in the lung tissue. And then uh, once they uh, sense the anti-inflammatory, they become activated, but then there's also recruitment. Um, so the active phenotype starts to secrete collagen, but that inactive does not. We have this, um, I've already talked about how this anti-inflammatory cytokine being triggered. And right now we have a very simple rule that is when that happens, 
that at that location becomes a constant source of um, a secreted anti-inflammatory, more generic anti-inflammatory model uh, molecule. We're considering it as uh, basically would be a TGF beta response. And that is what the fibroblasts that are resident and that are recruited are going to hone towards. So fibroblasts are going to move up the gradient of this anti-inflammatory cytokine and start to secrete collagen along that pathway. So this is uh, just a representative simulation um, of our uh, agent-based model, this hybrid model. There's some PDEs in the background for how the virions are moving around, how the secreted factors are moving through this tissue domain. So the epithelial cells are this light blue color or this medium blue. They don't move around. Um, there's a number of um, immune cells that are moving around. You see the neutrophils are moving quite rapidly as a response. And you'll start to see the T cells coming in and they'll be uh, more aggressive as well. Um, the macrophages were part of the innate immune system. That's why they were there so early. Um, and so you start to see that cells get infected and are grayed out. And if they are killed, we leave behind um, a little black dot for a little bit, and then it becomes white when that space has been cleared out or the debris from the dead cells. Um, we are now simulating the fibroblasts as these purple spheres in this particular uh, movie. And so we'll see that the fibroblasts are honing towards the gray regions to respond to where there has been cell death to try to replace that missing epithelial with collagen fibers. So physiologically, what we expect to happen is that um, after tissue damage, that the body would try to repair that by building collagen fiber networks and healing the wound. Um, but in some uh, cases it can get too tilted towards fibrosis and you may end up with a substantial scarring and we want to be able to simulate when there's too much fibrosis and then when there's um, not enough as well. So um, that's represented here. Um, so we can do those kind of simulations. Um, the color scheme was slightly different in this earlier um, schematic here with these immune responses I'm showing, but we can simulate different conditions where we have different of the immune factors turned on and off, the rates at which they do various processes. And so in all of these, we had substantial tissue damage being that there was this white region that was not acellular that would develop um, and substantial immune infiltration um, when we turned on the immune response. We, my team sought to say, or sought to add the fibrotic aspect to this, that we would fill in these blank spaces with this rule-based fibroblast response. So um, in this simulation, the fibroblasts are represented as the small orange spheres. And so this is showing the collagen field evolution that would arise in those blank spaces based on after the infected cell was killed, there's this anti-inflammatory signal fibroblast honed to that location and start to create uh, secrete collagen. And then the collagen is not mobile, does not diffuse in this simulation, but it gets secreted where there's a stronger um, signal of anti-inflammatory cytokine and when there are more fibroblasts um, that had honed to that region. So we're starting to fill, see uh, significant regions filled in with this collagen field. So Aminal uh, added that portion and then he simulated this under various conditions where um, we had a moderate disease condition of, uh, so we can control in the simulation environment, the multiplicity of infection that is related to the um, initial um, amount and distribution of the virus exposure on this tissue segment. And by, um, changing the time required for the CD8 plus cells before they kill um, an infected cell. So um, he chose the settings that would give us this quote unquote moderate condition and we could see um, then the evolution of the collagen in response to that. He also tracked the um, emergent number of um, fibroblast cells, CD8 plus T cells that would respond to that um, 
and we have some collagen secretion before we recruit substantial amounts of fibroblasts. So basically our rules say that if it's inactive, it is at a steady state. It's not uh, being, there's not more fibroblasts. Fibroblasts aren't able to leave. So that's a flat line. But as soon as we start to get that signal, the fibroblasts can start to move. And we also then turn on their, um, their birth and death rate at that point. So the model has where they can move away and can die out, but then there's this um, massive recruitment that happens after some lag time. So we start to see that, but then we get substantial collagen once these recruited uh, fibroblasts move into the zone. We also did the more severe condition. So you'll note that by the same 10 day time point, there's far less of the resonant tissue, the, the host epithelial tissue that remains, um, and you have much more substantial um, collagen that has formed, and you have quite the infiltration of the immune cells here in this tissue. So again, just by changing the multiplicity infection, you got this different um, severity case and can see the different um, collagen and fibroblast T cell responses. There's many other things that this model um, will give us. We were just interested in more about these questions about the collagen aspects from my team. So we are working on um, considering the ways that this collagen field might affect the diffusivity and the transport rates of different cells and the viral um, particles. We're also interested in the cellular regeneration aspects of the tissue, not just this fibrotic part. Um, we're also considering how collagen deposition can exert forces in the surrounding area um, and those conditions that would lead to it being um, pathologically pro-fibrotic in a way that is unhealthy. Um, we're also considering um, if we should be looking at collagen alignment and porosity effects and, and whether that's relevant at the scales that we're interested in as a, a larger team. And then there's several other aspects that are being incorporated um, by the entire tissue simulation coalition on refinements to the immune response part, refinements to the viral replication dynamics, um, and um, incorporating new data as it emerges specific to SARS-CoV-2 um, rather than more infectious disease generic um, types of um, numbers that may be in there right now. Everything is, is uh, can be, um, is in as a parameter and nothing's hard coded, but um, sometimes our representative parameters are inspired by um, influenza infection or the original SARS infection, um, places where there were um, established data. So, um, so that I think is the end of my presentation. I want to definitely again though acknowledge Aminul and his work um, on this project. Okay, thank you very much. That was a very, both, both of our speakers stayed to time, which is an unusual virtue, so I appreciate it. Uh, that means we have time for some discussion. So uh, please, uh, please uh, take advantage of that. And then again, if we can try to start with less technical questions and ideally from some of our, not our usual suspects and questions uh, and uh, uh, then we can always go and ha have more technical questions afterwards. Uh, I'm sure there are a lot of interesting issues for both, speak both speakers. Uh, some, some weeks we have two talks that are very parallel to each other. Uh, here talks, we, we had talks that were very orthogonal. One that was beautiful mathematics about how to build models and how to analyze models. And one very practical thinking about how to translate biological observation into uh, meaningful multi-scale models. Uh, and so that, that contrast is all of the serendipitous uh, kinds of things that happens in this meeting, which I really appreciate. Uh, thank you to both of our speakers. And if, if people have questions, please uh, feel free. You don't have to raise your hands, although uh, if you want to raise your hand, I'll try to keep an eye out and see who, who has uh, requests. So I, I wanted to ask something from Ashley. So if, if A, thank you, this was fun, and B, if, if you try to coarse grain this, would you try to do something in terms of averages, in terms of densities, or would you also put some spatial structure? W what would be the coarse grain model that would make you happy? In, in terms of what variables, not what operators? 
Um, meaning that you would want to, if, if I was to coarse grain this to get to like whole lung type of fibrotic processes? Oh, no, no. Or... If you look at the simulation that you, that you showed us, of course, one can say what is the average number of so much and so. But do you think that in terms of uh, reporting, would you want to only keep the average density of each of a few species? Or do you, would you also like to have some sort of correlations, like pair correlations, some, some measure of the microstructure of it? Do I make sense in my question? I think so. Um, so I know for, I'm trying to think about how to articulate an answer to this. Um, we know that there would, for this, there would not need to be, or having information like the average density of collagen would not do justice to this, okay. right? So um, we would want to be able to think about um, if it was something a simple thing to extract could be the peak collagen, or if it's um, sort of as dense as it can be, has it reached like a maximum um, or a close to, you know, impenetrable or very dense region where that's um, very fibrotic and that the rest is sort of okay fibrotic. Um, uh, and so that would be a, a piece that we would want to know some kind of resolution to. Um, for the other aspects, I think on the immune side, there's um, knowing whether things are sort of concentrated because they're actively moving there or just because they're near the boundaries. Um, so if there was something that could tease apart um, sort of the activity level of the uh, immune response um, that's not just cell population level, but sort of like how numbers of interactions or something like that. That also could be um, something that um, could be yeah. determined from like a network kind of analysis. So, yeah. um, and, and still relevant to these types of problems. Okay. I want, I want to second Giannis's comment, uh, which is that these spatial multi-scale models, which of course I work on as well, especially stochastic ones, they produce these beautiful movies and yet when we do analysis, we tend to do averages, maximal values, areas under the curve, at most first order neighbor correlations. And all of those lose a lot of the complexity of the spatial structure. Mm -hmm. And yet when we try to look for the more sophisticated spatial metrics like uh, uh, topological homology metrics, you have to have very, very large simulations, we need very, very large data sets to be able to do anything with them, bigger than you have available in experiment. And so one of the problems that we face is that we really don't know how to compare stochastic images or stochastic time series. To ask the question that Yanis asks all the time, which is, do these belong to the same universality class or not? Were they generated by the same mechanisms? Uh, and uh, this happens if we look at two sets of blood vessels and we see a blood vascular tree if we look at the vascular tree, we might characterize it by the branching angle and the interbranch distance. But in fact, you could have vascular trees that have the same branch angle distribution, the same interbranch distance, and have totally different structures. And so there really is a question, which is that there's so much information that our eyes see and appreciate in these kinds of models, the ones that Ashley showed that are so beautiful. And yet when we do metrics on them, we throw out almost all of that spatial complexity. And so the insights into the mathematics for the mathematicians about how we could actually use and respect that spatial complexity, I think it's a really hard problem. Uh, and uh, so ideas about how to do that would be, would be very valuable. Yeah, and um, you know, in the time to, you know, we we showed one movie, right? Each time you do these stochastic simulations, you get different movies, and we and we often will average or show a representative one. But we are interested in things that might be rare events that can also emerge, and and trying to detect those and to see that they're not just part of the, you know, is it if we run this a thousand times, we'll get mostly the same things, or do we ever get anything that's um, different types of phenotypes that might emerge and how to like characterize those. And so um, there's lots of uh, interesting future challenges with analyzing these systems. Thanks, James. I have a question for Ashley. Hi, Ashley, I'm Greg. Um, Hi. The 
We work a lot with folks in the, in the Lung Institute here that have clinical practices and we do a lot of autopsies on people who have died of COVID. Are, are you using, what kind of data are you using in order to, I mean, you, I can imagine I do things similar to what you're doing here. And I can imagine there's a, I don't know how many parameters, but there's a lot of parameters in your model. Um, and you showed a hints of what sensitivities exist if I start playing with those parameters. What kind of truth data do you have in terms of clinical data or autopsy data? We have, for example, now probably a couple dozen lungs that have been autopsied from people that have died of COVID. And you're making predictions about certain locations in the lung. And my colleagues who they never would never let me in doing the autopsy, but they tell me the results and the results are, are um, something that I think you are making predictions of and that you could potentially use as truth data for the things that you're doing and maybe learn some of the parameters for which you only have good guesses for. Absolutely. So um, this team got started uh, April of last year and sort of the main, I'd say our biggest momentum was from April until November. Um, now we're in like the polishing stages and going back to see now what is published, but the idea to build some infrastructure um, based on physiological mechanisms and processes that could be um, involved, but knowing that the actual magnitude of certain aspects were not yet known or quantified in the context of, of COVID-19 and to be ready to be able to put those in when those became available. So um, there are, some of the things are actually parameterized to data or have um, um, diffusion coefficients with reasonable magnitudes, that kind of thing. But some things are, you can actually put in any diffusion coefficient or any, um, but they're left as here's the thing you would need to specify, you can put them in, you can run the simulation. Um, we also, some of the thing, or a lot of the species are normalized where they're set from zero to one. And so you could then say, well, I know that this one um, in the future will want to weight those slightly differently or, or very differently. Um, so we definitely are at the stage now where there's things that are emerging, um, like the data you talked about, that um, I think the, the, the first product from this group will be this framework, and then the sub teams are working on doing that validation to data so that we could have for this particular um, case, I'm gonna run it with actually realistic things, I'm gonna do parameter estimation, and I'm gonna do a direct validation, um, and I can take this piece and now use it. But then other people could use it for um, other types of infectious disease responses, but have this framework that exists that then they can customize and, and pull out elements of, or use the whole thing, um, or run many of these kind of plaques in parallel and, and examine larger tissues, things like that. So. Um, so that has definitely not been completely done yet on this team, but it's definitely an interest in the future. And if people are, have that kind of data and want to partner, I think there's lots of opportunities. And the first author on this, I noticed Michael is on here. Um, you know, very, we're very interested in, in those aspects. So thank you, Greg. And the, I'm asking because the, related to what Giannis and James both said is that when we get clinical data, it's very coarse grain and it's static. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have snapshots of, of very advanced disease. And we are asking, do anything, does anything we do replicate? You know, so you're, you're, you're doing a, um, a really coarse grained learning mechanism, right? I'm, um, do I get disease structures. I mean, my, my colleagues who do these autopsies say the, um, the, the damage, first of all, they don't know what got healed. Um, that's a real problem, right? You, you only know what's, what's still damaged and you don't know, but 
But given what they do see, what they observe is incredibly patchy disease. Um, it is not a continuous infection of the lung. And, mm -hmm. um, and they have very specific areas of the lung in which they can go in and tell us coarse grain information about, um, you know, densities of, you know, the patches of, of infected cells, how many have died. Um, they, they observe cells that burst. Um, when, they, when they do die, they, they dump all their contents. So there's all kinds of, I mean, I, I am empathizing with you because in the work that we do, we're really struggling to ask um, what kind of data can we get that would allow us to go back in and, and do sophisticated learning of the things that we don't know. Um, anyway, very, very impressive, um, you know, amount of work, a ton of work. I can't imagine how many man and woman hours are involved in this, but it looks pretty impressive. So other questions? I have a question for Giannis. Um, yes. the, the tools that your team is developing, um, are there any um, uh, software distributions that you have or others where like people could yeah. download your software and could apply it to their systems or do people should people directly work with you if they want to yeah. try to apply yeah. some of these yeah. algorithms or no, fair uh, so uh, as you know in kind of recent years everything is somewhere on github yeah. so you can download something and run the examples in our papers um, for the other ones uh, i mean Okay, if, if it doesn't immediately go, uh, I, you know, within reason, we would be very happy to, to either work with somebody or to just help a little bit. We, I mean, we don't have to kind of, uh, how to say, enforce ourselves on, on papers. So we are happy to help within reason. But uh, there is GitHub repositories for everything that is in our papers. And, and we are happy to maybe explain a little bit. Also, if it's interesting, we could work with somebody. But no, we do not have, as, as you, I, I'm sure, understand, we, we don't have the, 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 the manpower, even though we would wish, to kind of make nice tools. So yes, things are reproducible, but it takes a little extra twist every time. Uh, as you know, there is no, I mean, no, nobody gives you money to make good tools, or at least not in what <laughs> we do. So. Uh, Sorry, but, but we are happy to help uh, without enforcing ourselves as collaborators. I mean, I think Greg, Greg brought up an interesting point, which is when you have static information, uh, you can't always, from a population of static images, infer dynamics. So, for, and I always, my classic example of this is if you have tumor size versus time, you know the net rate of growth of the tumor on average in multiple individuals, but you don't know whether that growth rate was happening because there was slow growth uh, and no death, whether you had very rapid growth and a lot of death and they almost balanced. And in the same kind of thing happens if you look at patches of lung damage later on, you don't know if you had many patches that were initially seeded and that grew at different rates or if uh, the patches started at different times uh, and you don't know if some of the patches grew very rapidly and other patches grew slowly or they all grew at the same speed. Yeah, I, I can say something to this. I, I don't, I, it's not a wonderful thing, but it's a useful thing. Uh, if you remember when I said I reconstructed the space, I reconstructed something that was one-to-one -one with the space, not necessarily the space. The same technology can be used to put things in order, even though you don't know if it was slower or faster between people. So it is still useful. You have a progression, you understand? Uh, as a matter of fact, at some point, there was a company in California in which if you gave them a, like a, a whole bag of photographs that you find in your grandmother's 
you know, the, the, the box somewhere, they would put it in temporal order for you. Uh, and it is quite easy to do. DARPA had a shredder uh, context in which they would thread the images and you could put them in order. So it is quite usual and not difficult to still use, a, I'm telling you the same thing. You, you may not have explicit time, but you can have order in time, which is also useful. Okay, well, I violated two of the rules that I said at the beginning. I asked technical questions and I spoke a lot. <laughs> so I appreciate people's patience. Uh, we'll have time for more questions for both of our speakers in a minute. I just want to say again uh, that uh, we would very much like the subgroup leads, you know who they are, uh, to begin to prepare presentations for these uh, Thursday meetings. Uh, please let us know when you're willing to present. Uh, I think our seminars are really good and any help you can provide in getting the word out so that we have a bigger audience would be much appreciated. Please do help us get the word out. Uh, and also agenda items for the steering group would be very helpful. There have been, as we mentioned before, some suggestions for more explicit statements of goals um, and what people think those should be for this working group would be appreciated. And so uh, we all would uh, be very grateful. Uh, many of the subgroups have been extremely active. Uh, some important topics are not so active, but this is a committee of the willing and we appreciate everyone's volunteer time for these things. So if there are any, are there any other uh, specific business that we need to take up before we open up the, uh, the breakout rooms and let people talk uh, in more detail to our speakers. And by the way, if, if your breakout room becomes empty, our speakers are free to go. Of course, this is all voluntary. I hope people will stay around and, and have some conversation. Is there anything else that we need to have as a general uh, talk before we, we have the breakouts? If not, I will, here, give me one second here. I will this, open the breakout rooms. This is uh, Reed Shaman from NIAD. I just had a quick yes, question. Um, there's a couple of funding opportunity announcements that hit the street just yesterday. Um, is the best place to put that information in the Slack channel? That would be good if you would email them to me. We'll also distribute them by email to our membership. Okay, thanks. Thank you. I believe me, everyone is hungry, so they'll be very glad to find out. <laughs> All right, sounds good. <laughs>